today. Good to have you. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you're uh, joining us. As we go into 2020, we're doing uh, this next steps for the next decade uh, series because we think it's really important to kind of start and get our steps going right. And so right off the bat, I just want to tell you about a few steps that I encourage you to take with us. One of them is it's, uh, we have a, uh, a conference coming up that's in your program. It's going to be here at the church. Uh, we actually uh, are the leaders of uh, the vineyard movement in this region, which is the Mid-Atlantic region from Maryland down to the Carolinas. And so we're inviting other uh, churches to come down and join us. We've done this. Uh, this is our fourth conference. I do it every other year. So it's amazing. You know, most conferences don't have kids stuff and youth stuff. We do that. We do it full on. It's amazing. The kids have a great. We actually have an international speaker. Uh, we had to reserve him over a year ago, and he, he agreed to come. A guy named Chris Hodges, second largest church in America, wrote a book that is called What's Next? Uh, we uh, made it available for you last week. And so this series is kind of based on that. Uh, somewhat, and uh, certainly you'll get a lot out of that on the back of your outline. You can see kind of a reading uh, suggestion if you're following along with us, which I certainly hope you are. And then uh, I also wanted to in, in bring to your attention the pastoral update card. We do this once a year. If you have not filled this out, would you please fill this out for us? Uh, we do not uh, use this as a, ma we don't, nobody else will get it. It's, you know, you're not going to be signed up for a mailing service or anything like that. We, I guard it personally. We guard it with, like pit bulls with our lives. I mean, we, we, nobody's getting this. Uh, if you are new, you'll just get a letter from us thanking you for coming, but that's it. You'll probably only hear, us one, hear from us once a year, maybe twice a year, because we don't use it that way. The reason we use this is if you're going through a difficult time, we want to have good information to get a hold of you, to be able to reach out to you, to be able to uh, help you when you go through difficult times. So that's what we use this for, and certainly I hope you would fill that out for us, and we'll collect that when we take the offering at the end of the service. And then we are in a Every, at the beginning of every year, we do something called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. And we are in that now one-third of the way. We started last week, 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. So if you're new with us and you just heard about it, then welcome to 14 Days of Prayer and Fasting. <laughs> you know, we want you to join us. You know, we don't get all legalistic about it. Hey, listen, there's nothing better than starting out your year with a, some prayer, saying, God, I need your help in this next year this next decade I, I i could help you i mean i could sure use your blessing and and one of the things we do during the 21 days of prayer and fasting is we gather on saturdays uh from 9 30 to 10 30 here right where you're sitting and we do some just some new testament prayer for one hour and we have a book for you when you come help you to learn how to pray more effectively we're not going to make you pray out loud or anything like that but you you'll be able to this will help you as you learn how to pray and, uh, and then the fasting part, we just say fast from something, you know, something that, uh, you know, maybe a meal or some media or whatever you want. Say, hey, I'm not going to do that for a little bit. It's not necessarily bad. I'm just not going to do that so that I can give my time a little more to God in prayer. So that's kind of the goal behind that. And, uh, and hopefully you will do that. So in this series, what we're talking about is next steps for your next decade and we want your decade to be all that God has in mind for it, what you want. The problem is a lot of people live below that because they don't really know what their life's about. They, they, you know, we like to look at it as life's kind of like a continuum, you know, where you, you, know, you have different steps to take. You take that step, that leads to another step. When you take that step, that opens up that door and you can do that. And so the problem is a lot of people don't even know what step they're on what they're supposed to be doing, what's the very next thing in front of them. And that is confusing. So the Bible, if you take out your outline with me, the Bible speaks to that. In fact, this is kind of our theme verse right here at the beginning. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are more blessed. So a big part of knowing your next step is knowing, hey, God's doing this in my life. And this is my next step. And so that word blessed, you can circle it. That means 
That means your soul. What is God doing in your soul? It doesn't just mean riches and good vacations. It means that, you, that you're letting that inner void that often is there when we don't know what God has for us, it gets filled. We're blessed. Another translation says, when there is no vision, people perish. And so some of you might say, that's the way my life is. That's the way my marriage is. There's, it's a mess. And, uh, and my job is a mess. And my personal life is a mess. And I have all these things. And I'm not walking in that blessing. Well, the Bible says, you need to get your next step going. You need to, and, and God says, I want that for you. We actually call that, that, that progression, the path of life. We get that from Psalm 1611 on your outline. It says, you will show me the way of life, or that could be translated path of life, granting me two things, the joy of your presence and the pleasure of living with you forever. The joy of your presence, that's what most people want, right? They, they want joy and they want, they want pleasure. God says, that is found in following me. That is found in me. And so we break those, that path of life up into four things four things this is the vision of our church number one is that you would know God that you would know God personally not he's not interested in just making more religious people he wants you to know him from your heart you know you can do things out of duty or you can do things out of love one is a noose around your neck it's just filled with guilt and have tos the other one brings life it's just life-giving. I do it because I want to, because I love. And so God says that's the relationship he wants you to have with him. It says where you know him, where you know him closely. And once you know God, that leads to the next one, which is to find freedom. Finding freedom from all the mistakes I've made of yesterday. All of the things I'm caught up in today, my addictions, my habits. You know, it's really, if you can picture, you know, all the things you do, that you know your life would be better if they weren't in your life. That's what he wants to give you freedom from. And we all have a little list. Yeah, if I didn't do that, if I didn't have that, if I didn't, you know. Yeah, that's the, what we're talking about. God wants you to discover freedom. And once you find freedom from your yesterdays and the things, your hang-ups and the habits, then you can really move into your future, which is discover your purpose. God wants you to discover your purpose. You have a purpose. You were not born by accident. I don't, re I don't care what your mama said about you. <laughs> you were not born by accident. God has a purpose for you, and it was planned in advance and he wants you to discover it. And once you discover your purpose, then you can make a difference. You can make a difference. And making a difference, again, is not about accumulating wealth or having the right friends and the right connections. It's about using the way God, the gifts that he's given you to serve others. To serve others. And that's how we make a difference. And so we want to know God, find freedom, Discover purpose. Make a difference. Today we're going to be talking to you about finding freedom. Okay? We're going to cover each one of those in this series. And so today, week two, is about finding freedom. God wants you to find freedom from your pain, from your hurts. How does he do that? Well, he does that through people. Through people. Which, you know, it's kind of ironic, actually that we get healed, God's plan for healing is for the people, because most of our pain is from people. They caused it. And yet God's plan is that you find freedom through authentic, transparent relationships with people, where you can open up, you can share. And here's what he says here, a great verse talking about that. Therefore, confess your sins, who did God know? To each other. To each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Healing. Healing comes. Often the greatest freedom comes when we're in authentic, close relationships with other people. We do that in small groups here. We call it Vineyard Network. And it's going to begin. We're in a semester break right now, but our small groups begin. And we're going to launch our new semester February 1st and 2nd. And, uh, and I encourage you, get involved in a small group. You say, I'm too busy. We'll help you to find a small group. We'll, everybody is, you're already doing things that in, with, with groups. It's, we're just inviting you to make a group where you can, you can find freedom, where you can really share yourself and be open and, and people lift you up and pray for you and encourage you. 
and says, uh, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. And so certainly God leads us. The greatest impact of freedom will happen, as I said, in relationships. In relationships. Authentic, honest relationships. But there's another way to find freedom, and that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you today about the freedom that's found through the power of the cross. What Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross. You've heard about that. What he did on the cross. But did you know what he went through on the cross was designed in advance by God and that it was for you. It was for you so that you would not just have salvation, but you would have power for living today. That's what God's plan is for you. I love this verse. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, it's foolish to other people. They just, oh, it's a cross. Yeah, you maybe wear it on, on a chain around your neck. It has no value. It's something that happened a long time ago. I mean, it's just foolishness to put your trust in that. But for those who are being saved, he goes, there's actual power there. Power to change a person. Well, there's a place, a prison in San Juan Campos in Brazil. This is a true story. And it's, it's uh, a, a prison for notorious you know, murders, a, a, a major prison. Well, the Brazilian government gave it to a band of Christians. They said, you can run it how you want. You can run it with Christian principles. And so they did that. They came in, they cleaned it up, they renamed it Humanita. And they... Uh, they, they uh, staff it with only two full-time people. All the other people that run the prison are the inmates themselves. They have help from the community around. Uh, each, uh, each inmate has some families that kind of adopt them, encourage them, help them out while they're in prison, and then when they get out as well. Well, the late Chuck Colson, who started Prison Fellowship, decided to visit there. And uh, so he, he goes there, and, and when he arrives... He's surprised to find that everybody's so joyful. They all got a smile on their face. And the guy who lets him in, opens up the gate and lets him in, is a murderer who now has the keys. And he looks around and everybody there seems to have the peace of God in their life. They're at peace with one another, peace with themselves. They, they're, they're working industriously. It's, everything's clean. They, uh, they have scripture, biblical sayings on the walls from Psalms and from the Proverbs. And then the guy who is guiding them, his escort, says, would you like to see the one inmate that we have still in prison? He's actually in uh, the, 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 the notorious cell where all the torture used to happen. And, he's, and so Chuck goes, sure, I'll, I'd like to see that take me there. So he takes him down this concrete corridor to this massive door. And he takes his key out, and he's going to open it up, and he pauses. He goes, are you sure you want to see this? Chuck goes, yeah, I mean, I've been in prisons all over the world. In, in, in solitary cells, I've seen him. All, I, I can, I'm, he's impatient. He goes, just open up the door. So the guy slowly opens up this massive door, and in there is this prisoner. It is actually a crucifix, a hand-carved crucifix on the wall that was carved by the Humanita inmates. And so this guard, this guy says, there's the prisoner Jesus hanging on the cross for us. He's doing time for us. Now listen, that is the power of change. That is a true story. God can change the human being, a, a person, a person's heart, a person's mind, but it's foolishness to the world. They don't get it. And so when we start to understand what Christ did on the cross, it sets us free in many ways, in many ways that maybe you're not aware of. Let me point to uh, Revelation. This is the, the very end. Uh, they're in Revelation, the end of time. He says, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ. So here... He says, there's salvation, and some of you, you have that. You've put your faith in Christ, and you know you have salvation. You know that when you die, 
you're at peace with God, and you're going to go to heaven. You know and you know her. It's not a, it's, you're not wondering. You know. And I'm thankful for that. There, that's, so, that's incredible. All eternity you're going to be with God. But listen, between now and when you die, it doesn't have to be miserable. You can, God has a lot for you. He has power and authority. He wants you to have. And many, many Christians do not access that. They just kind of live for heaven. You know, just kind of limping through life, trying to get through until they get, you know, into heaven. But that's not what we read here. God has more. Now notice he says, there's an accuser, that's Satan. He goes, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb. They're talking about Jesus. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb. He said, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because Jesus, when he went to the cross, he didn't have to do that, but he went as a sacrifice, which is a, what, which, what lambs were. Lambs were used as, as a sacrifice. Once and for all, that's why there's never needed another sacrifice after that, and by their testimony. And so this is uh, this God saying, I have more for you. You don't have to just live where you're at. And 800 years before Jesus came, and, and, and our country's only like a little over 200 years old. So you can imagine 800 years before, Isaiah, the prophet, actually details exactly what's going to happen at the cross. He details it. He says there, but he was pierced for our transgressions, Isaiah 53. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So four things, he says. These are the four things, and, they, and we benefit. We benefit from these four things in our life. And so I'm going to actually go through them. I'm not going to do them in the order Isaiah had. I'm actually going to do them in chronological order for you. And then we're going to, and, and listen, you can't really talk about the cross of Christ without being a little serious. But it's part of the message of the gospel, and it's what bought us our freedom. And so it's certainly worth talking about some difficult subjects. People went and saw the passion of the Christ, and that came out years ago. So many people just said, oh, it's just so sad. Some people said, I don't want to see it. It's just too sad. Well, listen. It is sad, but what it purchased is not sad. And so we have to remember, hey, that there is a purpose to it. You know, when, when God decided to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, he could have really done it in any generation. He could have done it in this generation. You know, but if he had done it in this generation, you know how he would have died. I mean, the worst you would die is, is through electrocution. Most states in the United States it's if they, that have uh, capital punishment is lethal injection. There's only five states. Virginia is one of them that still does electrocution. But electrocution, the last two electrocutions in Virginia, the people died in under two minutes. And so as bad as it is, it's only two minutes. When, you, when we talk about the crucifixion, that was the most excruciating way to die in all of human history. And God sent Jesus during that time. Right during that time. Because what happened there bought us our freedom. And so we're going to talk about that and these four specific things. The four wounds of the crucifixion. Number one is the whip. Now let me just set the stage for this. It began on Thursday night. Jesus gathers with his disciples. And in, an, uh, in a room, he has a meal with them. He washes their feet. They actually have com this Passover meal which we, when we do communion or the Lord's Supper, we're actually kind of remembering that. We're only kind of handpicking the bread and the juice, but there's a whole meal that went with it. Jesus has that meal. He washes his disciples' feet. Judas is there. Judas Iscariot, he's the one who betrays Jesus. He slips out after the meal, after his feet are washed, and he goes and he finds the, the, the religious leaders, and they pay him 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. And so he, he leads the guards to where Jesus is. Jesus, after the meal, goes with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's there to pray. He knows what's coming. He's familiar with Isaiah. He knows what's happening. And so he's preparing his heart. Now listen, some of you are going into something that's very serious. And you need to be praying. You need to be preparing your heart. That's part of the reason we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. We want you to be prepared for the things expected and unexpected. It makes a difference when you're prepared in, spiritually, when you, when, you, when you prepare yourself. 
And so that's what Jesus does in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and Judas brings the soldiers there, betrays him with a kiss, and they arrest him, and then they try him. And he's actually tried six times at night, from 9 p.m. all the way to 6 in the morning. Six different trials. He goes to Annas, to Caiaphas, to the Sanhedrin, to Pilate, uh, to Herod, and then back to Pilate. Uh, and, and even both in the Jewish and the Roman law, you are not allowed to try somebody at night. And they did it anyways. And they're making up stuff. I mean, they actually pay people to make up stuff because Jesus didn't do anything wrong. In fact, Jesus is perfect. He, didn't, he, he absolutely did zero wrong. How do you convict somebody who's perfect? That's pretty tough. you got to make up stuff. And so they're angry at him. They spit at him. They, uh, they, 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 they're punching him, slapping him, all kinds of things. They're, and finally, they, they, say, they sentence him to death. They sentence him to death. And so the first part that he goes through is what is called scourging, where they tie him to a post, and then they take this, pole, this uh, handle, about a foot and a half, two feet long, and out of the handle is nine long stri strips of leather, thick strips of leather. And they take horse hair, and they tie a bits of bone, of rock, glass, and wire all down each one of these nine of these nine piece strips of leather. They were called it the cat of nine tails. And, and, and now on TV, if you've ever seen it, they'll like hit them like this. That's not how it happened. The history shows that they would take those nine strips of leather and they would soak it in water for a long time so it absorbed water and became real heavy. So you actually had to have two arms to do it and it, so that it would be heavier and gouge in deeper. And then they would do 13 down his right shoulder all on those muscles, tearing all those muscle tissue out. And then 13 on the left muscles all in his shoulder. And there's a reason for that. I'll come back to that. And then 13 down the back of his, down the, his spine. 39, because in both Roman and in Jewish law, they said 39 is the most you could have because you would die with anything more than that. And so Jesus, he was, he was whipped. And so this is where this, this, uh, this point is, is the whip, that's on your, your outline, gives freedom to my body. Freedom to my body. Jesus took that. He was, he, he, he was, uh, his wounds, because of his wounds, we are healed, Isaiah said. And it's through his wounding. It says, he himself, there in 1 Peter 2, 2, uh, 2 24, uh, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And then there it is again. By his wounds, you have been healed. So God, he took the stripes on his back so we wouldn't have to. And all of those infirmities, all the sickness, all of that, he, pay, he, he paid for that. And so what you're saying, Andy, what are, what are you trying to say? I'm saying that God heals today. God heals. Physically, will physically heal you. He is not closed. The great physician has not closed up shop. He's still here, the living God. And God heals people all the time. I have lots of stories. God healed, he healed my kids, healed me. I shattered my ankle in high school in pole vaulting. They put a couple pins in and it never really worked right. The, the orthopedic surgeon told me, you'll limp the rest of your life. We, and I was limp. I limped for like a year and a half, two years. And I, I don't know if they, you know, I mean, it was crushed, but it didn't get put back together right because there was like, it would like, every time I would walk, it would like click and my whole skeletal system would kind of shake and, and I, I had this hitch in my step, couldn't really run real well. And they said that was going to be forever. And I was in a prayer service, a lot like we do on, the, like we're going to be doing this Saturday morning. And God's presence just showed up, and, and my and my ankle got hot, and it was healed. Why? Because I'm 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 somebody special now. It's because of what Christ did for me. And I was in prayer, looking to God. God, bring your healing. You go. Well, why doesn't He heal everybody? I don't know. I'm not God. But he does heal people. Some people are healed on earth. Some people are healed in heaven. Some people, are got, they get both, right? Lazarus got both. He died of something. Jesus raised him from the dead. Well, he still died. And then he was ultimately healed in heaven. So, I mean, God does different things with different people. But we seek him and say, God, I want healing prayer. Healing prayer. Some of that happens when people pray for you. That's why we uh, invite you up to the end of the service to come up. 
Randy, I, I'm afraid of that. What if I come up and don't get healed? So, you see, it, here at the vineyard, I know that other churches believe in healing, but let me just tell you, at the vineyard, we believe God heals not because there's some people that their whole theology is on, it's, it's faith healing. If you have enough faith, you get healed. Listen, that's not, that's not true. That's not scriptural. It's not right. Now, and so if you were raised in that kind of environment, uh, that's kind of a bummer, actually, because it has a lot of negative stuff that comes out of it, as well as being wrong. We believe that God's kingdom is breaking in. And Jesus says, pray when you pray. Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so we're constantly praying, God, more of your kingdom. And part of God's promise in his kingdom is healing, physical healing. So we just keep pursuing it. We don't go around making people feel bad because they don't have enough faith, which is not true anyways. It's not, it's not scriptural. So just that was a side thing. I didn't mention that to other services, but I <laughs> thought you'd want to know. Thought you'd want to know. Okay, so God gives healing. He certainly heals today. Then the uh, guards did something that they weren't supposed to do. They take Jesus into a back area called the Praetorium. You're not supposed to go there, but they took him back there. That's where the, the captain of the guards is, and, and kind of like their locker room. And they're angry at Jesus, and they're mocking him because he said he's the king of the Jews, and they wanted to be the ruler of the Jews. And so they spit on him. They put a purple robe on him, which is a, co a color of royalty, of kingship, and, and then they bowed down, laughing at him, mocking him. They actually blindfolded him and started punching him saying, hey, you called yourself a prophet. Who just punched you? How many of you know he knew exactly who punched him and he could have made him a grease spot right then and there? <laughs> Amen. I mean, God, he had the ability, but he doesn't. They can't rile him. He's, the Bible says he's like a sheep led to slaughter. He knows what he needs to do because he's doing it for us. And so he is punished by those guards. One of the guards, he's so angry, he's not getting, riling him up, so he goes and he makes this, this, uh, this crown of thorns. There's thorns there today and, and all throughout Palestine and, and Israel where you, these thorn bushes, they're like two inches thick, really, really hard to break, and they're almost like nails. And he makes this, thorn, uh, thorn, this crown of thorns and presses it into his skull. And de so deep, not only blood comes out, blood actually goes into his brain, causing enormous amounts of pain. And so that's number two, the thorns. The thorns bring freedom to my mind. Bring freedom to my mind. Now, I love this verse. In, in Isaiah 53, he says that the punishment, that's what the soldiers did, beating and mocking, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him. The punishment of the thorns. Where do we have most unrest, most un non-peace? In our mind, right? We're worried. We can't sleep. We're restless. We're nervous. We're stressed out. We, we're, we have fear that gets a hold of us. And, and listen, fear alone can keep you from doing God's, what God, God's best, right? Can fear keep you from trusting God and risk-taking for God? In your own life, can fear keep you from being generous in some way? It sure can. It, sur it certainly can. And so God wants you to have peace. Notice this verse, John 14. It says, peace I leave with you, and my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. He says, you don't have to have that fear that robs you of the peace. And he goes, the kind of peace that God gives is not the kind that the world gives. Hey, listen, the world has something to offer. Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't say don't go to counseling, don't get therapy. He doesn't say don't take medication. All he's saying is, is that he has a peace that's different than what the world offers. And so many times we seek the world's way of getting peace for our mind, and we don't go and look what God has to offer. God says, I want to give you peace. Peace, perfect peace. Notice this next verse. He says, you will keep him in, what's that? Perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Because he trusts in you. God will give you peace. He wants that for you. Some of you have been struggling with depression that you can't seem to break free from. And depression can be so debilitating. You know, more and more we learn about 
we're more aware as a society, certainly in, in our country, about suicide. And uh, we, we, more and more we're realizing that's really something going on in people's mind. They, it's, it's, it's hooked to being so depressed that they don't know any other option. And some of you have contemplated that. Some of you, maybe that's not your, your go-to place, but you have the debilitating depression that grips you. Maybe you've tried the world's ways. Maybe you haven't. But God offers you a perfect peace that you have access to. A perfect peace. Well, after the guards do all of that with the crown of thorns, they take Jesus back out into the public area. And now they're going to crucify him. Those, the people that were being crucified had to carry their own crosses. Jesus does that. He gets help a little bit at the end. But he carries his own cross. And when he's being nailed to the cross... They have two nails that go into his hands and then a nail into his feet. And in the Roman days, you know, the hand was, that's why they shook hands like this because the hand was like from the elbow down to the, to the finger. And so the, the, the nails likely went right into what we would call today the wrist because if it went into the palm, then it would just rip right out. So it went into his wrists. And then when they nailed his feet, they would actually bend his knees. And there was a reason for that. They would bend his knees and drive those nails into his feet. And the reason they did that is because you died from crucifixion because of suffocation. Because you couldn't breathe. Because your muscles and your shoulder had been, had been all shredded from the scourging. So you had no way of pulling yourself up to breathe and you would just sag down and so you had to push on that spike and you would slide up, and your back down the middle of your spine would, would slide on that splintery wooden cross. And you'd slide up just to gasp enough air. And maybe if you were going to say something, you couldn't say a lot. That's why Jesus only said seven things, and they were all very short. You might just say something, but you were mostly just trying to breathe. And people would die of suffocation. And so those nails, that's the third one, is the nails. It gives me freedom in my hands. He was pierced for our transgressions. All the things that you've done, the, sin, the sins, the transgressions, they happened because of what your hands did and where your feet took you. God says that he took the pain for that. Whatever you did, no matter how bad it is. Because that's what Jesus did when he took, when he took it. He says, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. I love that. That God says, I forgive you. And some of you have received that. There is nothing like it the day you recognize what God did for you and you receive his forgiveness. But he doesn't end there. He says, and I will remember it no more. How many of you know that there's a difference between forgiveness and remembering? Right? God says that. He goes, I, I remember. I mean, if, if, if a kid's out in the backyard and he's kicking his soccer ball and he and it goes through the neighbor's window, and he goes and tells his dad, Dad, I accidentally kicked the soccer ball through the neighbor's window. He's going to go and, 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 and pay for that, right? He's going to go over to the neighbor, hey, sorry, pay for it. But when he comes back, Dad still remembers. That kid's still in trouble. And some of you, that's your relationship with God. He has forgiven you, but he remembers it. And he's kind of holding that over you. And he's kind of, I don't know if I can trust this one, you know. You know, I don't know if I can really bless him like I want. And let me tell you, that is not the promise of the cross. God says, I will forgive you. And I will remember it no more. But listen, often, often the person who remembers it the most is ourselves. We're the ones that hold on to it. God says, I've forgotten it, but we don't. We hold on to it and remind ourselves, and we're filled with shame. The Bible says, fear not, you will no longer live in shame. The shame of your youth will be remembered no more. No matter even what you did as a kid. Because you don't have to live in that shame. The story is told of a kid who is in his grandmother's backyard. And he's got a slingshot and he's trying to shoot rocks through a slingshot. He can't hit anything. Literally, he misses every single thing. So he looks over after a while and he sees his grandmother's pet duck. And so kind of... You know, just out of impulse, he just winds up, shoot, hits it dead on, kills his grandmother's pet duck. He's like, 
you know, devastated. Oh, no, I didn't see that coming. I couldn't hit anything. So he hides the bird in a wood pile. Right when he does that, he looks over and he sees his sister watching him. So at lunch, the grandmother says, Sally, that's the sister, Sally, would you please help me with cleaning the dishes, cleaning up the table and washing all the dishes? Sally says, well, actually, Johnny told me that he wants to do the dishes today. <laughs> Johnny's the one who killed the duck. And then she whispers to Johnny, remember the duck. <laughs> he doesn't have any choice. He's bound. He gets up, he does the dishes. Turns out she does that every time, day after day. He's doing dishes for weeks, sometimes out of duty, sometimes out of bondage. Well, he's, he's so miserable. He decides, you know what? I, no matter what kind of punishment my grandmother gives me, I'd rather have that than what I'm getting from my sister. So he goes and he owns up. He goes to his grandmother. He goes, Grandma, I want you to know, I didn't mean to do it, but I killed your pet duck. The grandmother says, I know. I saw the whole thing. I was watching through the window. <laughs> She goes, because I love you, I forgave you, but I just wanted to see how long you would let your sister make a slave of you. Some of you are allowing Satan to make a slave of you. Some of you are allowing yourselves to make a slave of you. you when you have unconfessed sin, you allow that shame, that, that soiled conscience, you can't live with fullness, certainly before God and really with yourself. And God says, that's what I want. I want you to have a pure conscience. Notice this next verse. Just think how much the blood of Christ will purify your conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. You want to really worship? You want to really express who you are before God? You've got to have a pure conscience. And that happens through what Christ did. Through what Christ did. And so God says that he will heal our bodies. Heal our bodies. Give us peace in our minds. Take away the shame. Take away that soiled conscience. Give us a fresh start. But there's one other thing that he did. He was crushed for our iniquities. Iniquities. That's another word for sin or willful disobedience. He was crushed. You see... Around 3 o'clock, it was the ninth hour, which is 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus was on the cross, and he breathed his last, and he died. Well, that surprised everybody because often they'll live for, for many, many more hours, even days. And so what they would do is, is sometimes if they were merciful, they would take uh, some kind of bar, and they would like a crowbar, and they would smash their legs, or they would get it behind their legs, and use it as leverage on the cross and break their kneecaps or break their legs so that they couldn't push up anymore and they would die then quickly. So they, they did that to the thieves but they, that were on Jesus' right and on his left, but they go to do it to Jesus, and Jesus is already dead. So they're thinking, well, we'll just make sure. So they, one of the guards takes a spear, and he plunges it into Jesus' right there, into his heart, right below his rib cage. And what comes out is blood and water. Blood and water. Which medical science says that his heart had already ruptured before they ruptured it with a spear. So how did Jesus die? From pain? No. From blood loss? No. From suffocation? No. He died from a broken heart. A heart that was crushed. You know, that, that stirs something in me. Because I've had a broken heart. There's some things that have happened to me when I start dialing up that stuff. Tears start welling up in my eyes. I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes I've talked about it here on the, you know, and, and only a few times because it's, it's painful. It's painful. And sometimes God will say, okay, I want you to talk about that again. I'll go, no, God, please. These people love me. They don't, they don't need to hear that again. They don't need that. But I think he does it more for me, that I'm, I'm on the, you know, Lord, God is doing something in my heart. You know, God takes a crushed heart, and he replaces and puts hope 
and joy in it when nobody else could. When that divorce happened or the, the kid that you know, went sideways, you invested your life into raising your kids, pouring everything you had into them, and then they, they live a life that's self-destructive and your heart's crushed. Parents understand that. Parents, maybe somebody died way before they should have. Maybe you had a business go bankrupt. There's a lot of things that can cause our heart to get crushed. And Jesus says, I want to replace that. Notice this next verse. A joyful heart is good medicine. God's got some medicine for you. A joyful heart, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Dries up the bones. The spirit, the spear is freedom for my heart. God wants you to be free. And then this last verse. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's God's promise to you. He wants to heal your broken heart. Why not go into 2020, this new year, this new decade, and receive what God has for you? Certainly you need to know God and receive God's salvation promise, but it doesn't stop there. He wants you to have power. He wants you to have authority. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be free from the ailments in your body. He really does. God's will. You know, Jesus, his number one miracle he did, the three years he was on earth, was healing people. Healing people physically. He's, he still wants to heal you. Some of you, you need to receive healing. And in a few moments, you can come up and receive prayer. We'll be up here to pray for you. Some of you need peace of mind. Your mind is in turmoil. You're worried. You have fear. You can't sleep well. It's draining you emotionally, sucking the energy out of your life, kind of putting a cloud over your future. God says, I want to give you peace. Peace that the world doesn't understand, but I want to give it to you. God says, I offer that to you. You can have that. God says, you don't have to live with the shame of the past. Remember whatever you put in there, the person or the place. Remember the betrayal or whatever happened. God says, I want to give you a clean slate there. And then for those of you who have a, your heart is crushed, it's broken. God says, I want to heal that. I want to put joy in your heart once again. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Well, Lord, right now, I just ask for your presence to come here. We invite you, Lord. Let us, we know you're already here, but help us be aware of your presence, your healing presence, your presence to bring freedom. I want you to Right now, I want you to just declare right where you're at. You can just pray. Pray to God. Say, God, today I want freedom in my body. Whatever it is. You can just pray for yourself, but I'm telling you, having other people pray for you is better. But start there. Say, God, give me, give me the... Some of you have quit praying for that. Say, God, I want to start praying again. I, I've settled for less. And I, I'm going to trust that you will heal my body. Would you do that? And then say, God, give me peace. True peace. Peace that the world doesn't know anything about. Peace in my mind. No matter what's going on, all of the hurricanes of things in my, in my, in my life right now. Say, God, give me perfect peace. And you say, God, help me to live without the baggage of my past. Help me to walk free from that. And specifically, those of you who have your heart is crushed, would you say, God, give me the joy of my salvation? Would you say, God, replace the pain with your hope and your healing? If you've never put your faith in Christ, that is the beginning part. That's where you walk in. That's the front door. And God welcomes you home. He says, come on home right now. This is not about joining vineyard or joining the churches is about getting on God's team saying God I'm all in you've got my number and I want to I want to be part of what you're doing I want that if that's you then right where you're at would you just pray if you're online you can pray as well just say God I'm all in right now use me to make a difference you say God forgive me 
No more unconfessed sin. Say, God, forgive me for trying to do things on my own. Increase what you're doing in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.